Uh, well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, before we get started tonight, I just had a, a, a one specific announcement. So um, this year, the Mind, Brain, and Behavior program um, that I co-direct, I'm Mark Hauser, that I co-direct with Elizabeth Svelke, um, is launching uh, a new series um, in an attempt to both uh, provide people at Harvard and, and outside of the university with um, access, in some sense, to some of the faculty internal to the university to hear about the things they're doing. And so one of the ideas was that often our faculty are engaged in, in projects that really cut across uh, disciplinary boundaries. And there are many challenges to doing that. Uh, and so one of the things we wanted to engage in uh, this semester, and we'll see how it goes, we'll maybe continue it next term as well, is to engage with faculty who work at the edges, or as I'm calling them here, the fringes of different disciplines, and especially uh, uh, faculty who have recently written books that really capture what it means to engage in interdisciplinary work that falls within the general areas of interest in the Mind, Brain, and Behavior program. Uh, so tonight, as you all know, uh, we'll be having a conversation with Stephen Pinker, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but there's two others this term that I want to alert you to. Uh, Tuesday, November 6th, uh, in the same uh, place, uh, Lecture Hall B, we'll be having a conversation with Michael Sandel on a book that he wrote uh, last year, at the end of last year, called Against Perfectionism. And then on um, November 26th, uh, a discussion with Ed Wilson in the biology department on a book which is uh, soon to be released called Superorganisms. So those will be the two uh, following events uh, in the series. So I hope you will all uh, come and enjoy them. Uh, so tonight um, I'm happy to have uh, a conversation with a friend and a colleague, uh, Stephen Pinker, who is the Johnstone professor uh, in psychology, but what that also is, is a professor of mind, brain, and behavior. Um, and as many of you will know, Steve, uh, for a long time, has been engaged in really two kinds of uh, uh, issues. One has been his scientific work, trained as an experimental psychologist, working on problems early on having to do with visual cognition and imagery, having trained here with Stephen Koslin, uh, who was then beginning some pioneering work on imagery, uh, and then got very interested in questions about language and particularly language acquisition. And Steve has continued those threads throughout his career in terms of the science. But several years ago, um, over 10 years ago, Steve began to get interested in the popularization of work in the mind sciences and wrote in 1992 the book called The Language Instinct. This is just when I actually just met Steve. Um, and it really made a big splash. And what was nice for those of us in the cognitive sciences was that there had been a lot of popularization in evolutionary biology by people like Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins, but perhaps not the kind of level of popularization in the cognitive sciences that we all felt we deserved. Um, so uh, it was a great uh, delight that I think some of us had uh, Steve write the language and then continue to write books like that um, up until the present. Uh, so tonight what I want to do is uh, engage Steve in a conversation that targets primarily uh, his new book that just came out, The Stuff of Thought, uh, but also begin in part by going through some of the ways in which he's gotten to the point of writing this most recent book and then really dive into depth into some of the questions and issues that are raised uh, there. So Steve, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I want to sort of borrow a gimmick um, from Stephen Colbert. Um, so Steve, uh, <laughs> Steve was on the, uh, the Colbert Report, um, and the question I just have is language. Five words are better. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Memorized words, combinatorial rules. Excellent. <laughs> Good. So Steve was questioned about that, about having to do with the brain. So um, uh, he was actually, I guess you were prompted by Colbert that this might come on as the first well, question. Well, an, an assistant gave me, just as I was about to walk on, gave me a, a list of 10 questions that he might ask. And so explain how the brain, word, brain works in five words was one of them. Okay. So I had, I, had about, I had about 15 seconds to ponder an answer. Okay, so I, I did not prompt Steve at all for any <laughs> um, so one of the questions I wanted to start with, just to kind of going back a little bit, is that you were sort of trained in the cognitive sciences, focusing largely um, early on in visual cognition, and then got interested in, in the languages. And for many, languages, language has been thought of as kind of one of the crucial model systems for thinking about cognitive science in general. Why, why do you think that has happened? Why has language become kind of a model system in the cognitive sciences? What is it about the field itself? Well, partly it's that, that uh, language is so closely tied to what's distinctively human. Um, <coughs> language itself, uh, in, in the familiar form, is unique to humans. Uh, it, it's the medium by which we share our cognitive discoveries of the world, uh, our technological know-how. 
it's the medium in, by which we negotiate our social relationships. And what's also conspicuously different about humans compared to other animals, as, as you've often commented, is the degree of cooperation among non-relatives, which has to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and the degree of uh, pooled technological know-how. So I think language sits at the center of a nexus of human traits that, uh, that make humans so conspicuously unusual in, that, in the natural world. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't uh, disagree with any of that. I guess the question would be, though, I would, I would have thought you might have gone in a slightly different direction, which is to say that one of the things that's made language uh, such an intense area of scrutiny is, in some sense, the sophistication of the theoretical constructs that have been voiced for many, many years now, that have laid out a very specific statements about the nature representation um, yeah. that really are, in some sense, uh, an archetype of how to go about doing the cognitive sciences. Yes, true enough. And that, that is, an, I think, another thing that, that is uh, special about language. You can have a theory of the rules of language. And it, you know, it might be ra right, it might be wrong, but it can be a, a fairly comprehensive theory. No one has a theory of the rules of thought. Mm -hmm. That's just way too open-ended, or at least it seems way too open-ended. So language, can, I think, can be a kind of entree into the world of thought, since we do, we can characterize the constructions of English and many other languages in such detail. And uh, I'm following in a tradition of, of uh, Ray Jackendoff and others of looking just beneath the surface of language. What are the cognitive distinctions that are precisely encoded in, uh, in verbs, in nouns, in constructions that presumably interface with the rest of thought, which is so much harder to, to uh, nail down? Okay, so let, let, that, that's going to be a topic where I was going to come back to because of the book. Let me now g sort of give the flip side of that and see what your, your thoughts are. It seems to me that on the one hand, you can say the field of linguistics has very carefully kind of tried to describe some of the rules and regularities, made propositions about what might be universal, what might be open to cultural variation. On the other hand, at least some people think that linguistics has gotten so specific and narrow in its theory that it's detached itself in some ways from what can be now done in the cognitive sciences. So it seems to me, at least from, as an outsider, that there's a paradox. On the one hand, it's been put up as the domain of knowledge where we really can go into deeply, and yet some aspects of linguistics have gotten so formal and specific that they've detached themselves from what is made possible in traditional cognitive science or the neurosciences. Yeah, I think that is an occupational ha uh, hazard of linguistics, is to strive so much for a, a pristine formal theory uh, as to forget how it's implemented in the brain, how it connects to the need for people to communicate. Uh, I don't think it's a fatal problem, and I work very hard to bridge those levels, neither rejecting all of the formal uh, apparatus nor ignoring the way it connects to everything else. That certainly has been a criticism of linguistics, although I, I don't think it's a necessary part of the enterprise. So, so I mean, is, is, the, is, is, is the, you said it's not a necessary enterprise, but is, is the drift continuing? Is there, is there more and more rapprochement? What's, ha what's happening in your sense in the field? Um, I, th I think the drift is continuing. I think that in, uh, in a lot of formal linguistics, there are, are possible connections to cognition, to evolution, to social interaction, to neuroscience that aren't being drawn as much as I'd like to see them drawn. I mean, I think they could be. I, I think it's a shame that they aren't. So let me pick up on, on another part of what you just said, which is that um, one of the things that I think uh, captured your attention in the early 1990s was the use, the possible use of evolutionary theory to understand various aspects of psychology. What, what, what attracted you to evolutionary theory as a, as a tool to begin to explore the mind? For me, it was just uh, a, a source of ultimate explanations, that is, answering why questions, not just this is the way it works, but rather, why does it work this way as opposed to all the other ways you could imagine it working? And um, evolution takes it to a deeper level, saying that there is an overall rationale for our having language, namely to uh, share knowledge, to negotiate social arrangements, which can shed light on why language works the way it does. Um, to give you a couple of examples, uh, until I tried to connect evolution to, to language, uh, I did a lot of work on the difference between regular and irregular phenomena in language, regular verbs like walk, walk, and irregular verbs like bring, brought. And um, I always thought that these were just, that language made room for irregularity. There are rules and then there are exceptions to rules. But um, when you think about language as a uh, system showing design for communication, 
uh, or for uh, or as an aid to thought or any of the other functions that, that language might fulfill, it doesn't make sense that there would be a special mechanism just uh, making room for exceptions or a mechanism in the child that would learn the exceptions as opposed to just steamrolling over them in one generation. So why do we have irregular forms like bring, brought, and sing, sang? It didn't make any sense until I realized, well, it does make sense from a design perspective to lang for language both to have combinatorial rules, rules that order words and phrases and that order bits of words inside the word, and a system for memorizing words, hence the four-word answer I gave you to, to what, what is language. Uh, if you've got an ability to memorize words, which, and you can make arguments for why that would be a useful thing instead of having rules all the way down, then it's possible for the rule output of one speaker to be misanalyzed as a single word by a listener, say by a child. So for example, if you say um, maked, uh, which was originally the correct past tense for make in English, and people slur it, you can imagine a generation of children not hearing uh, it as a slurred, made as a slurred make, but just as the form itself. Mm -hmm. From that point on, the word becomes irregular for that generation and all subsequent generations. Likewise, for all of the other irregulars, they're basically misheard regular forms that are memorized whole by the word memorization system, and therefore the existence of irregulars is an epiphenomenon of the fact that we're able to memorize words in the first place. Irregulars are just words. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you a simpler view of language, not as a system that has rules and exceptions to the rules, but as a system that both memorizes and combines. Sometimes they have to compete over uh, inputs that are ambiguous as to which of the two systems produce them, and that's how these phenomena arise. So it's a more satisfying explanation, mm -hmm. and it leads to testable predictions, such as that irregular forms should pattern with the memorization of words in children, uh, in uh, brain damage, in um, electrophysiological responses, many of which subsequently were confirmed. So, so that, that's so okay. So, so I mean, the beauty to always to me of evolutionary theory was the fact that it both provides the explanation and the prediction. <laughs> Are these the kind of predictions that you that one could have not come at? I mean. I mean, by evolutionary theory, or are they really something that's specific to an evolutionary view? Well, that, that's a good question, because that prediction really just comes from a design stance, yes. from the assumption that language wasn't just cobbled together uh, for the, so that, that linguists and psycholinguists could appreciate it, but it actually does something. Uh, and the uh, um, invocation of evolution as the source of that design, as opposed to an intelligent designer, doesn't really change much. I think there are cases, though, that knowing that it isn't real design, but the simulacrum of design from natural selection does alter your predictions about what it was designed for. And some of the topics that I cover in, uh, in this book, in particular, indirect speech, innuendo, politeness, euphemism, I think um, show that it isn't just any old design, but evolutionary design. In particular, the fact that in any social organism, any almost all interactions involve some mixture of cooperation and conflict. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, a very specific lesson of post-60s evolutionary biology that I think one would not have made uh, if one was innocent of biology. And indeed, that people in the field of linguistics and psycholinguistics, I think, have failed to make precisely because they're innocent of modern evolutionary mm -hmm. biology. So let, let's, let's go with that a little bit, because that's obviously into the book. Um, what if one said, uh, okay, so evolutionary theory is fine insofar as we're talking about the pragmatics of language. Um, it's not giving you much leverage if we talk about some of the formal machinery, the syntax. What would you say? Well, <coughs> For one thing, if, you, if all you're doing is invoking a design stance, which I think does buy you something, it still does raise the question of why should the system be designed at all? Uh, and for that, you really, unless you're a creationist, you really do want to root it in the process that can, is capable of producing design in or, or signs of design in organisms, namely natural selection. And I suspect that even within the machinery of syntax, there are both phylogenetic and adaptive um, insights that one wouldn't gain uh, other than from taking a, um, uh, an evolutionary perspective. Oh, to give another example, the fact that um, syntax uh, 
at least neurobiologically, seems to be tied to um, parts of the brain that are involved in uh, hierarchical motor control, such as the basal ganglia and frontal circuits in, in the cortex. That's something that I don't think would, um, would occur to you unless you thought, well, syntax has to come from something. What is a plausible evolutionary antecedent? And that, uh, I think, focuses the search. Good. Okay. So let, let, let's 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 um, let's take that and let's move it into just one last sort of general topic, which is you've kind of gone from books that are specifically about language, the language instinct, to much broader ones, how the how the mind works. Um, and now in this last book, the two kind of got squeezed yeah. together. And in, and in one review, I think they said there's sort of two Steve Pinkers. There's the kind of the language guy, and there's the sort of the human nature guy. Um, What's changed for you, if anything, in your views about sort of the nature of the human mind from having written the language instinct up to the present? Have views about, have anything changed except for the fact that we've, we've now learned more? Has something fundamental oh, changed for you? Oh, something fundamental. Um, uh, perhaps, um, let's see. I mean, let me, let me explain your phrase. I mean, so, yeah. so I mean, you know, the language instinct is a is a is a beautifully expressed view about the sort of the nature of language, you know, coming from a strong nativist perspective that sees certain inbuilt machinery that sort of guides the acquisition system. Um, you know, we then move to how the mind works, and now it's not just language, but you're now taking the kind of the lens of a nativist perspective along with evolutionary theory to talk about the organization of the mind much generally. And those are sort of just general organizing principles. Yeah. Those get carried through here, but has anything changed in terms of those general organizing principles? Um, I'd say not in terms of the general organizing principles. The overall, the, the bird's eye view, the, the, basic, uh, the basic axioms I think I've carried over pretty much uh, verbatim, but with lots of filling in of, of the actual content, that is what actually goes into human nature. Okay, so here's, here's a, so let's, let's transition to the book. Um, You've often said that you know, you've had this obsession with verbs, and of course you start out the book um, going back, back to that obsession, so obviously you can't leave it. Um, but one thing that's, that I find interesting, interesting about the stuff of thought is that, and with your current research, is that you in some sense have left the part of linguistics that kind of got you going in some sense, moving from aspects of um, how verbs are conjugated, the structure of verbs, the syntax, how it interacts with semantics, to much more of the pragmatic aspects of language. Why the change? Is, is the old stuff boring? <coughs> oh, no. Uh, in fact, the book is, li like many of my books, is divided between kind of a cognitive half and a social affective half. Uh, and the work on verb semantics, I think, directly relates to our concepts of, uh, of causation, for example, uh, how um <coughs> the kind of model of intuitive physics that's packed into our verbs is also the model of intuitive physics that makes us so bad at real physics, like thinking that objects are impressed with a, a kind of a force or an oomph that naturally dissipates. Uh, that also, it, it also infects, I think, our moral cognition, uh, the fact that we tend to hold people morally responsible for things that involve um, direct uh, hands-on uh, causation, as your own work uh, has uh, illustrated. So I think that ties quite tightly to uh, the concept of causation that we, that we uh, appeal to when we use verbs. But then uh, to shed light on more of our social relationships, there I think the use of language in social context, the what the branch of linguistics that linguists call pragmatics is, is more informative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think of them as, as competing or mutually exclusive, they're just different aspects of the phenomena. So one of the things you, you start off with in the book is to talk about how there are these core concepts that seem to be part of the, the mind's machinery, time, space, uh, and causality. Um, and one of the arguments you engage in, which I, I wanted to kind of uh, get you to flesh out a little bit, is a debate in part with some of Jerry Fodor's comments about um, how, how sort of these concepts work. And as you described, sort of uh, taking off from uh, Dan Dennett's comment, is that Jerry seems to be the kind of philosopher who's like a trampoline. You make one argument, he bounces right back at you. Um, <laughs> so. Take on that argument. What is it about Fodor's claims about yeah. the world being kind of innately specified, almost completely, that you find kind of aversive, not appealing? And yeah. what, what do you want to replace it with? Right. Well, this is a, <coughs> a, uh, a notorious argument from the philosopher Jerry Fodor, my for former colleague at MIT, that uh, kids are born with an innate vocabulary of 50,000 words, including 
um, the meaning of to paint uh, a carburetor, a trombone, a doorknob, and so on, which seems absurd on the face of it. Uh, and I mean, it is absurd on the face of it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I wanted to look at the, he, he didn't propose it because of some gut intuition that everything is in the genes. It was actually a conclusion that he thought w inevitably flowed from a fact about language. The alleged fact being that words, uh, word meanings cannot be decomposed. That is, word meanings uh, are not amalgams of simpler concepts, but rather are atomic in the original sense of something that cannot be split. So the meaning of kill is not caused to become not alive. The meaning of break is not caused to become broken. The meaning of kill is kill. The meaning of break is break. The meaning of trombone is trombone, uh, and so on. And if the uh, meanings of words are cognitively atomic, there's one symbol that lights up in the head when you see the trombone and that uh, remains dormant uh, in all other circumstances, then that concept has to be innate because it can't have been assembled out of simpler parts. That's the logic of his argument. And I more or less accept the logic. What I, uh, the reason that I even stepped into this issue in the first place is that I, I disagree with the linguistic claim that word meanings don't have parts. And one of my early technical books, which I then condensed into one of the chapters of The Stuff of Thought, uh, is an extensive argument that word meanings are composed of parts, uh, that there are concepts like uh, goal, uh, act, place, path, uh, cause, and so on, that govern the syntactic behavior of words. So in order to, for a speaker to know, can I use this word in this slot? Can this be a transitive verb? Can this be an intransitive verb? Does this take a prepositional object? Does this take a complement? The only, the way that speakers slot verbs into sentences is to think, does this, not consciously of course, does this verb have the component cause in it? Does it have the component motion? Does it have the component contact? That makes sense of literally hundreds or thousands of linguistic phenomena. That's exactly the premise that Fodor uh, uh, denies. Uh, although I think without really considering all of the phenomena that many linguists have shown requires a, uh, a level of semantic decomposition into more primitive concepts. Mm -hmm. Now, if the uh, meanings of words are uh, amalgams of, of uh, simpler concepts like cause, contact, motion, goal, act, and so on, that also gives you a learning theory. Mm -hmm. Namely, children don't have to be born with the concept of, of break or move or, and, and so on. Uh, they might be born with concepts like cause or might develop them early in life. Either way, learning a, a word consists of assembling these combinations. So you have a learning theory, you've got a more plausible uh, account of uh, what's innate, uh, one that doesn't seem to violate evolutionary thinking, like how could we, how could evolution have given us the concept of carburetor hundreds of thousands of years before there were carburetors, for example, uh, and uh, I think leads to an overall more satisfactory picture of the mind. So one, one question that always comes up in evolutionary interpretations and that you've appealed to is that several hundred thousand years ago, an evolutionary stage happened that sort of set things up in the mind. So in one sense, what, you, what you'd want to argue is that things like cause, time, and space are primitives. Now, as you appeal to, some of those things may be much more ancient than the human species itself. And they yeah. may have evolved way before and be what we got from animals. What then, if we got some of those primitives, cause, time, and space from other animals, what can we now do with them besides mapping them into, so let's say, words? What else can yeah. we do? I, I think we can do two things. One of them is that we can combine them, and this goes back to the combinatorial apparatus of uh, grammar, which I think we only have because we have a combinatorial apparatus of thought that language externalizes. So we can um, think not only about contact and motion and goal, but we can have a more complex concept, namely, um, say to cut, meaning to cause something to move into contact with a surface, then rupturing and going through the surface. That co combination of concepts underlies our understanding of the verb to cut. And then in turn, we can uh, assemble the concept of, of cut into 
clauses like uh, Mary cut the apple with a knife or with a feather or, uh, or whatever uh, and embed sentences within sentences expressing more and more complicated ideas. And I think that is that uh, combinatorial ability is what gives human thought its open-ended uh, power. There's no limit to the number of thoughts that we can think. And I think the other thing that we can do with, uh, with these concepts is we can extend them metaphorically. Um, that is, and not metaphorically in the sense of self-consciously use literary ornaments, but in the sense of co-opting a mental structure that uh, developed for some concrete scenario, cutting apples, throwing rocks, uh, and so on, to much more abstract domains. So we don't only have to talk about a, a, a rock rising and falling, but we can talk about uh, someone's mood rising and falling, or the economy rising and falling. We don't just have to talk about um, forcing a, a branch off a tree, but forcing Sally to go by means of persuasion. And so all of these abstract realms, which may not have been a target of natural selection, are opened up to us if we can take more concrete concepts, kind of erase out the actual content and apply the logical superstructure to uh, other areas. So uh, I want to pick up on this because uh, one of the things that struck me, this is a, as, as we all have with kids, you know, anecdotes, but um, uh, in thinking about, you know, the animals I work on and the child I have, um, uh, is, is the power of analogy to kind of reformulate the conceptual structure. So this is a, a, a one story, there's probably millions of them. Um, we were driving along one day um, and uh, Sophia, the little one, was about five um, and she first starts by saying, there's, there's something I can't tell you about which is already an interesting construction. Yeah. Um, I said, well, you tell me about it, and I will promise not to get angry at you. And so it's a little bit quiet. And she says, um, well, um, you know that medicine you told me not to squeeze? Um, I squeezed it. Um, <laughs> and it's quite expensive medicine. She squeezed it all over the floor. And I said, well, you know, sometimes when people tell you not to do something, it makes it kind of harder not to do it, right? So there's about a three-second pause, and she goes, yeah, it's kind of like when we tell our grandmother not to smoke, and she keeps smoking. And we had wow. not been talking yeah. about my grand, my mother. You know, it was just completely not in the picture. And yet, all of a sudden, there were just variables, and those variables could be coordinated. And now that the conceptual space just opens up, and I thought, you know, no monkey I've ever watched could ever do this, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, it's a fantastic example, which, uh, which uh, James Lee and I are, are now trying to uh, study in, in Harvard undergraduates. We've had a lot more trouble than, than you had with uh, <laughs> Sophia, unfortunately, so far. But we're, we're obviously not asking the question right. But I, I do think there is a, a um, remarkable phenomenon uh, in human memory retrieval where one memory will uh, spontaneously activate another where the common link is not the sensory qualities but rather the uh, abstract logical structure. Um, and, uh, the, the example that first um, uh, led me to notice this came from a talk by the computer scientist Roger Shank which he talked about um, going to a barber and uh, he was annoyed, he had asked the barber to cut his hair short and he was mildly annoyed that he hadn't cut it as short as he wanted. And then he immediately thought to how he asked his wife to cook a steak well done and he was uh, mildly annoyed she didn't cook it as well done as he wanted. <laughs> now there's nothing in common between steak and hair and length of, of hair and toughness of steak that would lead one to trigger the other by sensory overlap, but just the logical structure of request someone to change something to some criterion, fall short of the criterion. That was a common thread in memory, salient enough for one to spontaneously uh, trigger the other. And uh, I started keeping a, a reminding diary. Every time I had one of these remindings, uh, I thought of it as a, a non-Proustian reminding, where if a Proustian reminding is a particular sight and, and smell and sensory sensation. This would be a purely intellectual or logical connection. And um, I found that I was, I, I, I had three or four a day until I, I got bored and I stopped collecting them. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you, uh, if you ask people to keep a reminding diary, uh, which I thought was the, the simplest sort of first order way of just documenting how common this phenomenon is, very few of the uh, entries actually are that abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, most remindings are much more concrete. Mm -hmm. So either Sophia and Roger Shank <laughs> and I are very strange, <laughs> uh, which I, I don't think, or we haven't been able to uh, nail these things down properly enough. But um, 
the more general moral is that this mechanism of analogical reminding, uh, assuming that we all have it, which I suspect we all do, uh, may be the mental act that allows uh, us to co-opt a mental structure originally dedicated to one domain to something completely different and crucially to then apply whatever valid inferences uh, are uh, applied to the first domain to the new one, therefore actually buying something in intelligence or, or mm -hmm. inferential power. So one of the, the one things that triggers me is, is here's an analogy which may not be clear immediately, but I'll, I'll make it anyways. Um, there are a lot of entrance exams and IQ tests that, that force qu questions about analogy. Yes. Right? And no, we're often is. pretty bad at these things. Right? I mean, yeah. a lot of people are pretty bad at these. And yet, there's some ways in which we seem to be quite good at certain kinds of analogies. And so, one of the questions is, is, is it in the same way that, for example, take the waste and selection test. When you put it in these formal terms, we're really <coughs> bad at them, but translate it into a social context, and all of a sudden we become quite good at them. Is it possible that the domains that are being required for us to analyze in formal entrance exams are not domains that are, that are readily translatable, but that in the logic of social context, the analogy is perfectly tr transparent? Yes, that, that's quite possible, and th that, uh, that the ability to, so to bleach out all content and just to see the abstract underlying structure is a kind of, is the, the particular uh, skill that we select for in academia. That's what kind of, that, that's what you do if you're an academic. You, and which is also often why academics are so abstruse and lose contact with, uh, with reality because they, they see the skeleton without, but not the flesh. Um, so not us, but <laughs> not us, but, uh, 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 but more generally. So it's, it, it is possible that it's, a, it's kind of a hard, a specialized mental talent that is exercised in some settings, but not others. Okay, I want to I want to switch gears here because I also want to give some time for people in the audience to ask questions. I want to let's turn to the social domain. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, some of the interesting ideas that come up in the book on implicatures, and I want to start by talking about bribes, um, and just give you uh, a, a, a story of a favorite story of mine of a friend of mine, a uh, paleontologist who was working in Kenya, and was on his way back to the United States with a huge amount of fo fossil material. And the uh, guy at customs says, well, um, that's going to cost you $5,000 in customs fees to bring this across. And he said, well, I could give you that $5,000, and I'm going to want a receipt, or I could give you a dollar. And we'll just leave it at that. And the guy said, you know, what do you think I am, a dollar? <laughs> it's a dollar or nothing. I'll take the dollar. And off he goes. <laughs> Never pays the customs. So here's a bribe that yeah. works, but the, but, the, but the cost could have been very high. So you have a view in the book about how you basically go yeah. about negotiating bribes. So can you just say a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I use this too um, as a different way of analyzing a phenomenon that has long been of interest to linguists, namely indirect speech. Cases where a person doesn't blurt out exactly what they mean, but uh, veils it in some kind of innuendo. Uh, uh, like a polite request, if you could pass the salt, that would be awesome. Uh, which when you think about it, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but, uh, but we recognize it as a, uh, as a polite request. Or, uh, would you like to come up and see my etchings? Which is kind of the, the classic uh, sexual come on. Uh, or, gee, officer, I was hoping that we could, uh, could, could we settle the ticket here without any paperwork, uh, a veiled bribe. Where I think what's going uh, on is the, um, there's what game theorists call the identification problem. Namely, you can't be sure what kind of listener you're facing. In the case of a bribe, a corrupt officer who would uh, accept the bribe, or an honest officer, this being bad news in this context, who would rebuff the bribe and perhaps even arrest you for attempting to bribe an official. Uh, and the question is, how do you get the benefit of bribing the uh, corrupt official without taking the risk of uh, an arrest for bribery if you have an honest official? Well, if there's a scale of uh, indirectness or, or, or vagueness where um, you can craft your words so that it's ambiguous that it could be a bribe but isn't necessarily a bribe, you could aim it directly between the threshold of a uh, corrupt officer who would accept the bribe and whatever standard an off honest officer would need to make a bribery charge stick in court beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm and that, that the, uh, a lot of the indirectness I in language, not all of it, but a lot of it consists of uh, splitting that difference. It's, by the way, it's another example of how uh, an evolutionary mindset can change the way you approach a problem because indirect speech has been 
uh, a topic in linguistics and philosophy since the 1950s, since uh, J.L. Austin, how to do things with words. But as far as I know, no one has looked at it in terms of um, a possible adversarial relationship between speaker and hearer. The whole body of theory has assumed cooperation. Uh, Grice's famous cooperative principle, namely speaker and hearer cooperate in order to move the conversation forward. Uh, and the theory of um, Levinson and Brown uh, on the phenomenon of politeness assumes that speaker and hearer cooperate so that uh, both of them save face. But the idea that you might actually be foiling the designs of some of your listeners when you choose your words, which would come naturally to an evolutionary biologist, where you always have to ask if any act of communication is it a transfer of information or is it manipulative, uh, that was the, the natural starting ground for this analysis, but was, as far as I know, absent from the literature. So one, one of the things in which this parallels is that um, the, the evolutionary literature also started off by assuming that communication is cooperative and information bearing. And it's really with the advent of kind of the genes I view the ad adaptationists that people started challenging that and say, no, actually communication is about manipulation. And then there was a countervailing force that said, well, if you have selection for manipulation, you need to have selection countervailing manipulation, which is mind reading. So to what extent do you think that the speakers are sensitive to the mind rating capacities of their listeners so that you'd get differences in terms of who you're addressing, in terms of how much you can get away with, and how implicatures are loaded up in certain situations yeah. versus others? Yeah, well, I think it, the, the process of implicature, which is the linguistic jargon for um, basically for what everyone else calls innuendo or, or putting your putting your, hiding your message between the lines, counting on your listener to, to uh, read between the lines. Uh, very much depends on um, theory of mind, intuitive psychology, and uh, often uh, autistic children whose um, intuitive psychology is impaired will have trouble with indirect speech. Uh, to, to give an example, a friend of mine who had an autistic son uh, called him, and uh, the son picked up the phone, he said, is your mother home? And the son, the boy said, uh, yes, and just stayed on the phone, not realizing that the is your mother home means can you put your mother on the yes. phone. <laughs> uh, and there, there are many examples like that. Uh, but also, um, it, but it's not just wielding this ability, but I think it is wielding it in a, in a um, possible, partly uh, adversarial way, namely how can I float an overture to someone who might accept it without getting nailed by someone who would reject it. Mm -hmm. uh, that often goes into the, the machinations that are involved in indirect conversation. And I think that um, it also adds, I think, one the fact that you can not only craft a vague utterance, but the other party knows that you might be crafting it, and you know that they know, and they know that you know, and so on. It embroils it, the, the whole process in, in an extra level of intrigue. Because um, the, the one limitation of the um, kind of the game theoretic analysis of indirect speech, say the case of the veiled bribe or the veiled sexual come on where, where it's detectable by a willing partner but uh, you can't be nailed by an unwilling partner, is in cases where there isn't any real uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, cases where either uh, basically all of the listeners are, are willing, uh, say in, in case of uh, bribery in many contexts, like in the third world, it's just mm -hmm. Everyone is bribable. Uh, everyone may even demand a bribe, and so there's a, a thin line between bribery and extortion. But from what I understand, people use indirect speech anyway, mm -hmm. um, as in your anecdote. Mm -hmm. Likewise, in a, in a sexual context, I mean, no one's really fooled by the line about, would you like to come up and see my etchings? Uh, except, of course, George Costanza in <laughs> Seinfeld, who, <laughs> when, when uh, his, his date asked him, do you want to come up for coffee? And uh, he said, um, no, 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 caffeine keeps me up, I better <laughs> not. And only uh, on his way out does he realize that coffee doesn't mean coffee. Um, but for everyone else, I mean, the humor in that is that everyone knows that coffee doesn't just mean coffee. So the question is, if you know that coffee doesn't mean coffee, why do you say coffee? Mm -hmm. Why don't you just say, do you want to come up for sex? It right. means the same thing. Right. And I think it's the, uh, I, I think it is this a phenomenon that uh, economists and logicians call uh, common knowledge and mutual knowledge. Mm -hmm. Namely, there is a logical difference between two people knowing something and two people knowing that the other knows it and moreover that the other knows that they know that the other knows that they know uh, ad infinitum. 
And logicians have devised a number of uh, ingenious um, brain teasers where you can only solve it by attributing uh, common knowledge to the, the participants. But a more everyday example is um, the story of the emperor's new clothes, where, which is a story about common knowledge. Namely, when the little boy said, the emperor is naked, he wasn't telling anyone anything they didn't already know, anything they couldn't see with their own eyeballs. But he was conveying information nonetheless. Now everyone knew that everyone else knew that they knew, and that everyone else knew that everyone else knew. And that changed the social dynamics of the situation so that people felt they could challenge the authority of the, uh, the, the emperor. And I think even in dyads, there is a difference between blurting something out, as the little boy did, which generates common knowledge. Namely, not only do you know something, not only does the other person know something, but you know that they know it, etc. Versus innuendo, where innuendo gives you um, identical individual knowledge, but not common knowledge. And we maintain or switch relationships based on uh, common knowledge. Mm -hmm. So this, this um, kind of recursive process of anticipating what the other person thinks about what you think, I think is very much necessary to explain this uh, phenomenon in cases of low uncertainty. Right. So let, let's, um, I want to make sure I have some time here for questions. Um, let's end with a less veiled, perhaps, uh, act of speech, which is swearing. <laughs> um, so there's a whole uh, wonderful section on swearing words. And I, 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 can't, I, I remember vividly the day that my father um, brought home George Carlin's um, album, uh, <laughs> not knowing actually what the content was, because he had just heard a, a monologue of Carlin's, he was a wonderful person about language, and turn it on to he, for us to hear in glorious stereo about the seven <laughs> deadly words. And my father was of this kind where he thought, well, just like Carlin, they're just words. Yeah. So my brother and I, at a very young age, were going around swearing until we got into a classroom and we were told, uh, that's not okay. My parents were brought in and my mother had to explain to the teacher that my father had brought home George Carlin's <laughs> album and was going around swearing. <laughs> in the um, so so what, what, what is the structure of swears? I mean, yeah. why are they there? What are they coming from? Why do we use them so often? Yeah. Sometimes. Well, I think the common denominator of swearing is that um, taboo words uh, refer to uh, objects or actions that uh, are surrounded by strong negative emotion. Uh, awe of deities in the case of uh, religious swearing, um, uh, dr uh, revulsion at sexual depravity in the case of sexual swearing, disgust at bodily secretions in the case of uh, uh, swearing about uh, bodily effluvia. Um, Hatred of, uh, of uh, despised groups in the case of taboo ethnic terms, ethnic slurs and racist terms, which are, people don't call it swearing, but I think it's the same phenomenon. Uh, and the difference between a taboo term and a euphemism that refers to the same thing is that in addition, there's the communicative intent that I'm bringing this up precisely in order to offend you, to make, cause you to think about the most disagreeable aspect of the phenomenon. So the word uh, euphemisms like uh, you know, waste or orger or uh, manure or stool and so on are all specific to a context in which you uh, make it clear to the listener exactly why you have to bring up the disagreeable topic, making it totally clear you're not doing it in order to gross them out. On the other hand, if you tell someone, uh, will you pick up your dog shit, <laughs> then uh, you're using a word in, precisely in order to remind the listener uh, that, that the object is disgusting in that, uh, in that context. That, I think, is the core of swearing. That is uh, what linguists sometimes call dysphemism, the opposite of a euphemism. A euphemism is designed to hide the emotionally charged aspects of a referent. A dysphemism is designed to rub the listener's face in it. From that core, uh, once, once you have a word that has the power to evoke this emotional reaction, uh, probably by uh, triggering a response in the amygdala, which is the, the part of the brain that responds to threatening and dangerous uh, uh, stimuli, it can then be co-opted to other purposes, to uh, uh, verbal abuse, that is to uh, humiliate or intimidate someone, to arousing a listener's uh, attention. And uh, one other use of swearing, which uh, uh, is, I think, related to, um, again, to evolution, is that the kind of cathartic swearing that we engage in when we, um, you know, cut our thumb together with a bagel or, uh, or spill a glass of beer in our lap, uh, where the 
topic of our conversation suddenly turns to theology or, or sexuality uh, <laughs> or excretion. <laughs> probably comes from, I think the, the ultimate explanation of that has to be partly in our, uh, our evolutionary history, namely the, the rage circuit, which is common among uh, mammals where an animal that's suddenly injured or confined will uh, erupt in a furious struggle and uh, accompanied by an ear-splitting yowl, which I think in the case of humans gets filtered, patched into the language system so that we articulate our yowl with a word that we're ordinarily inhibited from saying and which refers to something associated with strong negative emotion. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of capsule yeah, yeah, of good. the discussion squaring good. in the book. Okay, so let me uh, uh, open up for a couple of questions um, before we close. Uh, in the back. <laughs> uh, yes, it, well, there's one chapter uh, where I um, kind of line up the three theories that, uh, that, that this book is not or does, doesn't embrace, um, just to sort of position it um, with respect to possible alternatives. So one of them is Fodor's uh, extreme nativism, uh, that is that the meanings of words are, are innate. The other is linguistic determinism, that the language you speak determines the thoughts you can think. And the third being a, th a, a theory that I call uh, uh, radical pragmatics, somewhat associated with uh, connectionism, namely that there is no stable structure in the mind corresponding to the meaning of uh, a word, that all we have is a diffuse network of associations, and that word meanings can be uh, in molded indefinitely to the context. And so the very idea of setting down the meaning of a particular word, uh, as I try to do, is, uh, is, is misguided. So those are the three theories that I kind of triangulate my own against. Well, uh, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, I, I, ex I suspect that there has to be some uh, innate component, uh, given that, as, as Mark pointed out, uh, it's very hard to conceive of how an animal, even one who possessed the concrete concepts, could be induced to extend it analogically, um, carrying over all of that, that superstructure. What exa how it, it, exactly it develops in ontogeny, what's there from the outset, what matures, uh, is, I think, right now very difficult to, uh, to establish. If I were to place my bets, I'd, I'd guess that, that a big <coughs> chunk of it is innate, um, using arguments basically similar to those that go back to, uh, to Kant, namely, uh, without the ability to make certain basic distinctions, you couldn't get cognition and including learning off the ground. You can't learn everything. Something's got to be there in order to accomplish the learning that has, that has to take place. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, that anyone now can uh, empirically demonstrate exactly what, uh, in fact, is innate. You mean like, um, you know, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Fu fucking A. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that um, the, uh, there, there's a kind of swearing that I, uh, I distinguish five kinds of swearing in the book on, on uh, uh, linguistic grounds. One of them is idiomatic swearing, you know, shit out of luck, um, uh, pain in the ass, uh, what the fuck, where it's completely unclear what those words are doing in those constructions <laughs> <laughs> on, on linguistic grounds. Uh, yeah. And I, I think what happens is that, that the 
uh, taboo words, once they have their origin in strong negative emotion, they are tools with which you can ping someone's uh, amygdala, where you can basically, and, and hence their, the general arousal of, of their uh, brain. And so if you need to get someone's attention to wake them up, to you know, open their eyes, it's, it's an irresistible um, uh, weapon or tool, um, and therefore can be extended not only uh, as a kind of lazy effort to keep the listener's uh, attention, but also can be used, I think, in a positive um, way among peers in an informal setting to say, this is the kind of s circle of friends where you don't have to watch what you say, where you can break these taboos. You won't have a school marm, you know, wrapping your knuckles. Uh, you can, that, that's the kind of uh, a circle that you are now in. Uh, and, um, and then it, it spawns literally hundreds and hundreds of idioms uh, that involve these, these words. There's a dic whole dictionary called the F word by uh, Jesse Scheidlauer, uh, a respected lexicographer, where he accumulates, I think, 350 different uh, idioms with fuck. Uh. One last question in the back there. Yeah, um, I, I suspect the answer is no, because writing is such a uh, recent innovation in the history of our species. Um, it's, uh, alphabetic writing appears only to have been invented once in all of human history and to have diffused from the, uh, presumably the Canaanites who originally invented it. And there's still very high rates of um, dyslexia uh, in otherwise normal people, much higher than rates of, of uh, specific language impairment. and writing tends not to emerge spontaneously but requires schooling, whereas spoken language emerges uh, spontaneously in, in kids of a certain age. And perhaps actually this might uh, connect to Mark's original question. Is there any fundamental assumption that I've had to rethink uh, recently? And I think there might be one, and it's related to your question. Um, namely, could there be actual biological adaptations to recent innovations, recent meaning say, the last, last uh, 5,000 years or even 50,000 years. It's been a working assumption of evolutionary psychology that uh, most of our evolution was pretty much in place uh, way, way before the agricultural revolution. So our minds are basically adapted to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. There is some recent, very recent genetic evidence suggesting that looking at statistical variation among, um, in, in the human genome and that through complicated techniques can detect signs of natural selection directly in the genome, which suggests that the, the human genes have been under very strong selection, uh, including uh, over the last five to 10,000 years. Uh, in fact, according to one study, you see the same um, strength of selection in contemporary humans as you have in domesticated crops like corn, which have changed beyond recognition uh, o over the last 5,000 years. Now, we don't really know what, these, what has been selected for. Uh, it may just be disease resistance. But at least on biological grounds, we now have reason to think that there could be uh, adaptation in the human brain to innovations of the last 5,000 years or even more, more recent uh, innovations. So I, I would not be as prepared to rule that out as I would have been, say, 10 years ago when I wrote uh, How the Mind Works. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to end by not swearing at you, <laughs> uh, not asking you to come see my etchings, <laughs> but thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks.